Well, this is week four of our series, uh, Stand, which is based on Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, where Paul says, hey, put on God's armor and stand. We talked about in the very beginning, you know, when we're wearing God's armor, all we have to do is stand. It's his victory. It's his armor. And we simply stand and don't, don't let the enemy push us back where we lose ground and what he's accomplished, what, what God has gained for us. Um, every single week there was like this a real applicable intro of things that happened in my life. So I can't wait for this series to be done. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, I, um, I do want to say thank you. Many of you know, and maybe if you don't, my mother did pass away. She, she was uh, in the hospital a week ago when I spoke. She did pass away on Monday, and I went to South Carolina and spent some time making arrangements for her, and uh, we have a memorial service scheduled in the, in the future. But uh, I do want to say thank you for your kind words and your encouragement. Um, you've been very uh, tender and loving through all this. My dad, actually, who lives in South Carolina, uh, he feels the love from Radiant, too, so I'm passing on his thanks as well. When we were talking, my dad and I... Can I tell you a story first? <laughs> so my dad is getting over COVID. He's, he's technically clear. Can I tell this story? Okay. So I decided it's probably best not to stay in the house with my father. I just came and visited from a distance, and we shared a little bit details. He had to sign paperwork for the funeral home, things like that. So I, I decided I'd get a hotel, which, by the way, hotels in my hometown, Buford, South Carolina, are really, really expensive at the moment. So I decided I'm going to try an Airbnb and just get a private room for 60 bucks. Sounds like a deal, right? Well, here's what they don't tell you. Uh, on Airbnb, they don't tell you the address of where you're going to stay. So I booked this place. They show you kind of a general map, and then all of a sudden the address pops up, and I actually wasn't sure, but I thought, no way is this the place. And uh, I pull up to the address, and it was like my ex-girlfriend's house <laughs> from like 26 years ago. So spiritual warfare, man. No, I'm just kidding. It's not... <laughs> I'm just kidding, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so anyways, <laughs> wow, so weird. Oh. Anyways, back to the message. My dad and I were actually talking about the arrangements for my mom, and he asked me to do the memorial service, and I was like, ooh, I saw this coming the moment I said I'd be a preacher. I really didn't want to have to do the, the memorial service for my mom. And I began to talk to him a little bit about like my philosophy on doing funerals and memorial service. Some of you are going to be like, Jerome's not doing my funeral. But it, it, it's developed because I worked for a guy who I saw do a funeral one time, my, my boss, my mentor in Kansas City. And after this funeral, I was like, you could have said something nice about that guy, Pastor. But he was, and his response to me was this. He's, he said, listen, we don't, do, uh, we don't do memorial services for the deceased. We do it for the family who stays behind. We're doing it for their sake. And he said, that we don't want to make a saint out of a person. We want to be honest about who that person is. It's true that they are good, but it's true that the family who's sitting out there, they know the other side as well. And if all we do is just elevate into absolute sainthood, the people who are left behind are starting to wonder, well, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with my memories and my perception? So there is a mixed bag of, of good and bad. My mom was 99% saint, but there's 1% there that is reality. My percentages are probably a little bit off. I'll tell you one story, because it's one story that stuck with me. And, and, and I'm, I'm not saying this to dishonor my mom. I love my mom. Um, but just one story, because maybe you could identify with this. I remember my brother, who is brilliant. He's a banker. He lives in a house that's four times bigger than mine, because he's four times smarter than I am, apparently. Um, <laughs> he, he was a straight-A student, and he came home with like a, I think it was A minus or a B plus. And my mom was like, how dare you come home with those grades? And I'm sitting here going, well, wait a minute, mom. And I kind of come to his defense and said, what about my C's? <laughs> and my mom's like, well, I don't expect you to make A's, Jerome. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I know that was just in the moment. She was upset about whatever that was about. Um, and just in case you're worried about your pastor's intelligence, I took a test when I became the, before I became the pastor, this thing for like general managers of golf courses, and I hit it out of the park, so I'm smart. Uh, 
I just did not apply myself. But that, 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 those words stuck with me. And they became something that you play over and over again. I guess it happened in the 90s, so I would say it's an old VHS tape. And I could, I could picture that conversation over and over And what, what happens is we live up and down to the expectations people have of us and we have of ourselves. Am I right? You guys know what I'm talking about. In, in psychology, they call it a self-fulfilling prophecy when expectations influence behavior in a manner that actually confirm those original expectations. Whether your own expectations or others' expectations of you, things have been said either not in a great spirit or maybe even accidentally or just kind of on the fly that have stuck with us and have, have stuck us, and we've not, let, we've not let those things go. The assessment from others shapes our self-perception, and those other quotes begin to be played back in our head and in our own voice. And sometimes we even forget what incident it comes from. We don't even remember the details of where we picked up some thought about who we are. But that thought does shape how we view ourselves and how we live out our life and our circumstances. I'm bringing this up because we've been in this series, Stand, which is on spiritual warfare. And we've talked a lot about different things, trials and peace and and lies, and truth, all these things, the devil's schemes, like we saw earlier in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 20, we saw earlier the devil is scheming. Now, he can't have our soul. We've said this every single week. If you put your trust in Jesus, you are secure. I mean, you could walk away, but that's another discussion altogether. But he, but he can influence and steal our joy, our peace, our family, and influence, and our witness. And when you begin to believe some of these tapes that are lying, I'm not saying that the devil wants to play on those things. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. If you've ever felt like your value comes from your productivity, it's going to shape the way you spend your time. If you believe that your worth comes only when you win, then you'll beat yourself up when you lose. If you feel like the only way you can be satisfied is if you get that one person's approval, it'll shape how you live your life and the decisions you make because you'll do everything to get that approval. I, I'm a youth ministry veteran, and I know this to be true in the lives of, of students. There's that girl or that boy who always has to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, respectively, because they felt like that made them valuable, that someone else saw them worthy of being their significant other. And so you would see teenagers who go from one relationship to the other because they're afraid of being alone because their whole world and what they believe about themselves is wrapped up in having someone else approve of them. These are not necessarily birthed in a scheme of the enemy, but since they're stuck to us, I think the enemy would like to play on those things and shape how we live our life because the things that we really believe about ourselves do shape how we live our life. And we believe what the Bible says. We believe the truth that comes from the word. We also believe these things, and they seem to be at odds. Turn with me in your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 6. As you turn, let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, this is our fourth week here, so maybe you know this already, but Paul wrote to a church in Ephesus, a church that he knew very well. He spent uh, years there, visited a couple times, even had a special visit with them on another town, just the elders from the church, so he could say goodbye his purpose is to say, here's how we live in light of the cross. And he gives some very practical, after some doctrinal introduction, he gives some very practical steps of what it means uh, in the home, what it means uh, with your, your relationship with your parents or your spouse. You know, you know these verses that come right before uh, where we're at. Very likely written in 62 AD while he's a prisoner in Rome, chained to a Roman prisoner or a Roman guard very often, uh, or at least, you know, they're passing by where he's at. And he's looking at their armor, and he's, he's drawing comparisons to what God has given us as Christians to fight the, the, the fight of faith that we are in. So he illustrates it. Now, just to give you a little reminder, early on, he says, put on the armor. Then he walks through it. There's the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the, the shoes of peace, and the shield of, the, the shield of faith. Which brings us to chapter 6, verse 17. But we're going to read the whole thing. Because that's our last time through. A final word, be strong in the Lord, so starting in verse 10, and in his mighty power. 
Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be, able to, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. No, yeah, that's right. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. So we're going to focus here. We've seen all these other pieces of armor. We're going to focus on verse 17, um, the helmet of salvation, the very first part of that verse. Put on the salvation as your helmet. The Roman's helmet usually made of, of, of some sort of metal, uh, like bronze or iron, uh, oftentimes would be lined with something that's soft to kind of help bear the weight of this metal helmet, whether it was felt or sponge. Sometimes there was even a hinged visor. And it's funny because every time I come up here and describe Roman armor, I'm thinking, you guys have seen the movies with the Roman soldiers, as historically inaccurate as those can be sometimes. They were decorative and they were mainly protective as well. Uh, and not just decorative, of course, but that was part of it. But they're designed to what? Protect the head from a blow to the head. So Paul's looking at the Roman soldier's helmet, and he says, yeah, you know what? In a very similar fashion, as a Christian, we have a helmet too, and it's the helmet, what does he say? Of salvation. That's the salvation. Put salvation on as your helmet. Most, the, most his, interpretation of this passage historically is associated this with the mind, that our, our mind is influenced by our salvation and our standing and the hope that we have. Uh, Paul uses helmet of salvation in another place, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. Let me read that to you. But let, n let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. The Christian soldier's helmet is the confidence of their salvation, our assurance of future and final salvation. Here Paul simply says the helmet of salvation or but it's the, the confidence, the assurance of our salvation both now and yet to come. The salvation we've already received, forgiveness, deliverance of, from Satan's bondage to sin. We're no longer slaves to sin. Adoption in God's family. We've already received those things. We live between the now and the not yet. That's what we've received now. But when you talk about the helmet of salvation, there's also the not yet of our salvation. That there will one day be a resurrection. And one day we will be with him in glory transformed one scholar says this that which adorns and protects the christian which is enable, which enables him to hold up his head with confidence and joy is the fact that he is saved and we might add that he knows his salvation will be perfected in the end as those who are assured of salvation we are resting our hope in the future and living in our world with eternity in view that's the helmet of salvation now, I remember I've said in the past that all these things are somewhat related. We're going to see how they tie all together here in a moment. But remember, there's a lot of overlap. Righteousness, uh, shield of faith, breastplate of righteousness, obviously belt of truth. Let's go to the second half of verse 17, the sword of the spirit. The Roman sword was not the long, awkward, heavy sword that you see from like King Arthur's Excalibur or Lionel's sword from Thundercats. It's not that. That was for you, 90s kids. It's a short sword. The, the Greek word was makarea, not makarena, but makarea. It's a maneuverable weapon used for, for close personal encounters, quick jabs and waves. And it was used for defense and offense. But I know the context of this passage, when Paul uses it, he's saying it's defensive. We stand our ground. The Christian sword, then, what is that? Well, the Psalms describes a, the, the speech. He describes speech as the sword. But, but really, in the Psalms, you see the speech of the wicked as a sword. But we also see that God has a sword. 
his word is a sword. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. It's exposing and revealing. It's cutting like, the, the, like, a, like a surgeon's scalpel with precision. In this context, as a defensive weapon, it's, it's to be used in the person who holds it. It's a, it's a defensive weapon for someone who holds it. Paul defines the sword by saying it's the word of God. The word is the spirit's sword given by the spirit. God puts the sword in our grasp and enables us to use it. It's the spirit's sword in our hands. God's word. Jesus did this when he was tempted by the devil after his baptism. In Matthew chapter 4, we, we know the Spirit sent him into the wilderness and he was uh, tempted by Satan. Let's recall this, and I love Jesus' responses. And I know this is the English translation, it's the New Living Translation, so it's like more dynamic in language. But can you just picture Jesus? Satan says, hey, if you really are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus is like, <laughs> no. <laughs> Scripture says, I love that, no. I think sometimes we view like Jesus as some sort of like our movie betrayal. Like, no, Scripture says. I just think he's like, Psh, no. That's just my Jesus. I don't know about yours. Yours could be Hollywood, Charleston Heston Jesus, if you want. And then he says, he brings up Charleston Heston's Moses. I understand, I understand. You know what I'm saying. Then, then, then the devil brings him to the top of the temple and says, hey, if you are truly the son of God, then jump down because... Because scripture says, now this is the enemy speaking, this is the devil speaking, that scripture says that, that his angels will, will protect you. He's quoting Psalm 91, misusing the passage. And Jesus' response is, the scriptures say you must not test the Lord. So he responds once again with the truth of scripture. And then the third temptation, kneel and worship, and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. I love this. Literally, my New Living Translation, get out of here, Satan. For scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. See, Jesus recognizes the lies because he knows the truth of God's word. Paul's idea here in Ephesians chapter 6 is for us to know God's word so that we will have similar conviction and power to defend ourselves against the schemes of the enemy. The very fact that it's of the spirit, the sword of the spirit, you remember when Jesus, uh, forgive me for doing this, back in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, when Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples, and he says he's going to, he's promising the Spirit. Listen to this, John chapter 14, verse 25 through 26. I'm telling you these things now while I'm still with you. But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything I have told you. He will remind you. See, the, the Spirit has a job description of being a reminder. He reminds us. He reminded John centuries, not centuries, excuse me, decades after Jesus had died, risen, and ascended. And John finally writes his gospel at the end of the, the, the first century. He's being reminded, oh yeah, Jesus said this. Inspired by the Spirit, writing the gospel, the Spirit's bringing to memory things that he said. Jesus spoke to his disciples that the Spirit would give them the right words when he sends them out. That the Spirit would remind them of what he said when they were put on trial and the, when, they, when they were uh, persecuted for proclaiming. The Holy Spirit has a reminding ministry. The Greek word here for remind is um, hupomenesco. And I probably butchered that, but that's okay because you don't know. Maybe one of you or two of you do. Your translation might say to bring to remembrance. The first half of that word, it's a, it's a compound word. The first half is to place something alongside or uh, something else. There's a comparison that takes place. But then the last part of that word is to remember, to recollect, to recall. And when you combine those, the idea is that something or some, someone whose memory has been awakened or who is enabled to recall something that something came back to mind, and that's, that's what the Spirit does. 
When the enemy ta- attacks, the Holy Spirit will reach into the word of God that is stored within our hearts and our minds and draw out the exact verse or truth that we need at that moment. And some of you can say, yeah, I know that. He, has, he does that. The word of God is the sword of the spirit, and the spirit helps us wield it. Because we don't always have it with us, right? But we have it with us, if we have it with us. So I look at this passage, and I think of the previous messages, and I think of all that we've done to help put on the armor ourselves. And I think this is the one point I want you to walk away from today, because it, it, it dealt with the mind, but I think that all deals with the mind. That God's armor allows you to stand your ground on the battlefield of your heart and your mind. All the weapons we've talked about so far are designed to help us fight the battle that's waging in our heart and in our mind. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. Remember how we applied those? It was, what's going on here? What's going on here? Shoes of peace. All that's going on out there, but what's going on here and here? The shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. Our mind is the battleground of the spiritual battle. Week one, I I read the verse, and we read it today as well, when Paul says this, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. I don't know about you, but my imagination kind of runs wild when I hear that verse, especially when I was a kid, because I thought of Slimer from Ghostbusters, you know, the little green guy. But he's not saying you are called to fight these invisible ghosts. That battle's happening here. And in here. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verses 6 through, or verse 6. So, let, so, let your sinful nature control your, so letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. God's armor allows you to stand your ground on the battlefield of your heart and your mind. And if we think about the temptations, we think about the decisions we make, we think about all the mistakes, and we're thinking, well, wait a minute, what about the... You know, there's a, there's a battle raging for, you know, I, I struggle with X or whatever it is. It all kind of happens in our heart and mind before we ever flesh it out. Our thoughts and our emotions. We, we live our life out of our thoughts and our emotions. So what do we do? First thing I would say is give leadership to your thoughts. I, I've, I've mentioned in the past that I have a... Uh, a relationship with a ministry center to pastors that I go and I spend some time with them. And I'm totally stealing this from them, but I want to pass it on because I think it's really great. He said, Jerome, you got to leave leadership to your thoughts. He said, who is driving the train in your brain? Very often we live right out of our heart, our, our, our feelings, our thoughts, and our emotions, and they drive all of our decisions. So he, he has this little wooden train thing. And actually, I was online this morning looking for, I want to buy that little train thing. He has a little wooden train with a little magnet and a little, you know, little, you've seen these before, people spell their names. Um, Well, all he has in his office is this little wooden train, and then the next car, he has a T, E, and D, and he'll flip them around. And he says, and he describes me, he goes, Jerome, it sounds like you're living your life, and what's driving the train right behind that that engine is the the E car, it's my emotions. That in a situation or a circumstance, temptation or trials, that the emotion is what's driving my thinking. And then my thinking, in turn, drives my decision making. He says, we need to flip this around. And he would take the little train and unplug it. And he'd put it here, right behind the car. And he takes the D and he goes, first you make the decision. I was like, how can you make a decision? He said, no, the decision you make is a decision based on faith. It's a decision based on what you know is true, what God has declared about you, what God says is true, and what's in your heart. You you know who you are. You know the the way that God says we ought to live. So it's... Hi. Anyways, I just hear this. Uh, There's a decision that we make in faith. I know this is true because God's word rests in my heart. 
I know this is true because he's met me in his word and confirmed it. And the spirit brings it back to memory. And based on that true, that decision by faith, that I am who he says that I am, then I could, then I'll think through my situation and circumstances, and then my emotions will follow. But oftentimes we just let our emotions drive us. This is what we shared a little bit about with the cry to walk in the spirit life skill I shared last week, where you would say, hey, I'm dead to that. And if you weren't here last week, I'd like to get these into your hands somehow. Maybe we'll send them via email as an attachment. There's two, and it's straight out of the place that I've spent my time with, um, this resource center, the cry to walk in the spirit that that in, in the face of needing to control or needing to put leadership to your thoughts, when, when those moments when you are believing lies, whether it's temptation or just down on yourself far more than, you, than thinking that God's down on you but not, that you would, you would say, you know, that's, my old, that's the old Jerome. The old Jerome thought he wasn't good at math. <laughs> but I'm brilliant. Anyways, the old Jerome believed that about himself. But I, I'm dead to that. Because Christ died, so did I. Christ was raised. I am raised to new life. I am a new creation. And I'm going to yield my life and my body to what I know is true, this new person. That's that cry life skill. But if you think about giving thoughts, your leadership to your thoughts, that's what all the armor of God really is. It's, it's giving leadership to your thoughts. The breastplate of righteousness, no matter how unworthy you may feel because people make you feel or, or because your performance hasn't measured up to your standard, you know what? Your righteousness is his righteousness. We sang that song today giving leadership to our thoughts. So let me give you one more life skill and we'll end this. Is it warm in here? Just take it. Okay, good. If it's not warm in here, then I'm in trouble. Let me give you one last life skill. This is um, something the navigators have said because I don't know if you've recognized throughout all this, this series, I keep, and I was trying to like break it up because I don't want to keep saying every week. So what do we do about the armor of God? We got to know the word. We got to be in our Bibles. But really, that's true. Like every week we've been in this series. And so much more even now when we're talking about the sword of the spirit, the word of God, the navigators have this thing where they talk about grasping God's word, grasping the sword of the spirit. And they have this, they, they, all five fingers grasp the word of God. We have to hear the word. We have to read the word. We have to study the word. We memorize the word. And then we meditate on the word. And most of us know about reading, hearing, studying, and memorizing. Even if we don't do it, we know about it. Most of us aren't necessarily, we're like, especially, some of us sometimes are skeptical about meditating on the word. I'm not talking about um, I'm not talking about that. So what's meditating on the word? Because we throw that around there, but have we ever been given that skill? So let me share this. And I, I could actually get this in your hands um, because this is not Jerome's original work. But this is a skill that as a pastor that I'd like to share with you because it's blessed me. So here are the steps for, mem- for meditating on God's word. First, we saturate our inner person with God's word. We let it dwell richly within us. We memorize it. First, we have to memorize God's word. We have to know what the word says so that we can have the word with us when we don't have the written word with us. And then we visualize it. We ask God to give us a word picture of, of, of what's in the text. Let me give you some examples. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. You visualize a shepherd and you are a sheep. Psalm chapter 1, blessed is the, those who don't, you know what I'm saying, like a tree planted on the riverbank, strong and secure, bearing fruit. Ephesians chapter 6, the armor of God. You memorize it, you visualize it, and then you personalize it. You put yourself in that picture. You become the big, stable, fruitful tree planted against the water. You become the, the sheep in the shepherd's arm. You become that soldier wearing the full armor of God. This is meditating on Scripture. Then you harmonize. You speak the word. You sing it. You confess it. You pray it. Whatever it is, Harmonizing is an act of faith where we express who we are in Christ. The biblical term confession means to speak what is true. 
So, for example, Psalm chapter 1, thank you, God, that I, when I meditate on your word, I am indeed that tree that's stable and fruitful. I had someone in our, in our congregation come up to me and say, you know, every morning I pray and I put on the armor of God. I've had this told to me a couple times. Like before my feet touch the ground, I'm like, Lord, I'm putting on the belt of truth. And I know that seems mechanic and maybe weird to you. It, me too. But I totally admire it. What would it be like if I started my day that way? God, I'm putting on the breastplate of righteousness. Before I, my feet hit the ground and I interact with anything and anyone. The shoes of peace. That's meditating on God's word. And if you're not used to it, it's going to seem awkward, but I encourage you, I dare you to try it. And then there's memorize, visualize, personalize, harmonize, and then triggerize, where maybe, maybe you actually do pass a, a field of sheep, and you're like, oh yeah, the Lord is my shepherd, and you see yourself. But what are the odds of passing sheep? More than likely, you see a tree, and you're like, I'm like a tree planted on the river bank, bearing fruit in its season. I said at the very beginning of this message that we have those things that we believe how, that shape our world, how we interact and how we make decisions. Some of them are, are, are lies. Some of them are careless words. Some of the things that we just not let go of. And we have God's truth about us. And sometimes they are at, at, they are at odds. the thing about knowing God's word let me just use an example and I'll close on this I was, I was trying to figure out the way to close this message and I, I think this is it I was driving in this morning and I thought of just the, that, that person that says something hurtful for you to you that could ruin your day ruin your week And they forgot they even said it. And you want to fight back, and there's this, mm, I want to push back. Now, we know God's word says, you know, vengeance is the Lord's and turn the other cheek. But you know what? My emotions are screaming at me. And I don't really care. I don't really care that God gave me the to-do list of how to act. And I mean, really, it, my emotions will overpower that. But when I know who I am, that that comment, that judgment of my character, that judgment of, of disapproval, whatever it may be, when I know who I am, I don't have to worry about turning the other cheek because it does not near, it doesn't it doesn't sting. So it's not trying to muster up to do the right thing. It's just because I am who God says I am, and that thing loses way it loses a whole bunch of power in our life. That's spiritual warfare as far as I'm concerned. Because when you let into the anger and you let into the, the, the chasing after and the revenge or, or even the, I'm going to muster the strength to shut my mouth, whatever that may be, I mean, I think the enemy uses that. I mean, it's better to shut your mouth than not shut your mouth, but the enemy does want to steal your joy and your influence. He wants to go after your family. He wants to go after your peace. Put on the armor of God. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you. What a privilege we have. Because your son, Jesus Christ, when we put our faith in you, you've dressed us in your armor. May we be intimately aware with the benefits, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, that we may live as you've called us to live. In Jesus' name.